Welcome to the Highland Wonders Podcast, where we share stories and knowledge from experts about the charismatic species and diverse ecosystems of the Okanagan Highlands of North Central Washington. My name is Jen Weddle, and I am one of the two directors of Okanagan Highlands Alliance, a nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to protecting the beautiful Okanagan Highlands. In this episode, have you ever been out walking in the woods and felt like you were being watched? Or heard a noise coming from somewhere overhead? But when you stop and look up, there's nothing there? If you are out wandering the forests of the Okanagan Highlands, or Alaska, Canada, or the inland Northwest, it is possible that it's not your imagination. Those eyes that you feel just might belong to an enormous owl with a six foot wingspan, bright yellow eyes, and an appetite for the tiniest of rodents. Matt Marsh, wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service in Tenasket, Washington, shares his observations and studies of great gray owls, the Phantom of the North, through his work on the Tenasket Ranger District. What you are about to hear was originally presented in OHA's Highland Wonders speaker series and has been modified for this format. Life is what we make it. It's all that we are. We're all what it is. Cause we're living. Blessed on so that that's a chick the first one was the male and again that's a that's a chick we'll get the female here shortly That's the female. The, the great gray owl, they're an icon for a lot of people. Um, and boy, once you see one, you, you'll never forget it. My name is Matt Marsh. I am a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service right here at, at Tenasket, at the ranger station here. I've grown up here my whole life. There's a lot of faces here I recognize from my old doctor to my old Spanish teacher. So uh, it, it's, it's good, good to see those faces. And then a few folks from the Ranger District as well. My background with Great Grays is that for our survey season during the spring, I go out uh, early morning or late night, the typical owl hooting period when you can, when you can find them. Everybody's either going to sleep or, or fast asleep. Um, I'm just starting my, my day, so I usually go out and uh, I'll have survey routes that I they go to. And for our Forest Service projects, we are uh, mandated to to survey for great gray owls if the habitat's present. So that's where my experience comes from: going out and observing, um, trying to find nests, trying to find individuals, and then uh, managing those forests um, to uh, maintain, promote, and preserve. Uh, habitat for not only the great gray, but a uh, array of wildlife. If you ever think you saw a great gray, one of the, the telltale signs are, are the eyes. They're just beautiful yellow, like a barred owl is just uh, beet black. But great grays are beautiful yellow, and they just they, they look they look right into your eyes. The beak, they're almost as yellow, if not more yellow than the than the eyes. Uh, real yellow beak. Other owls, other similar forest owls, have almost an olive or a brown beak. So that really bright yellow beak is also a, a telltale sign of a great gray. It's gray too, right? So everybody says, oh, I saw a great gray. And I say, well, okay, what color was it? A oh, brown. Okay, so you didn't, you, you, did, you didn't see a great gray because they, they truly, 
the reason they got the name was they're gray, right? So they're, they're a large gray owl. Uh, we talked about the yellow eyes and the yellow beak. And then the, the huge, large facial discs you'll see around the eyes, right? And no ear tufts. Great horn's fairly common owl that, that everybody um, sees around. And you, you, you'll see the ear tufts, hence the horned owl, right? Great grays, are, there's no horns. You won't see any protrusion uh, above here. They're just perfect, round, uh, symmetrical. So no ear tufts and large, large facial discs. This is really prominent when you see them. If anybody ever asks you, well, how do you know if it was a male or female? With great grays, you can tell. So the male, he's got that low kind of six note, just hoot, 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 hoot. And the female, she's more delicate and a better singer. Whoop, whoop sound. Um, and then the, the screech is the, the, the little chick. So the males and females look identical. And, and really the only, only way you can tell them apart is by the, the vocalizations. Lifespan, the, the studies down in um, Oregon, 12 plus years, you know, for, for an owl. And then they start breeding. Um, the earliest they've ever tried um, in the, the literature is about two years, but they, they're not real successful. So right when they hit three is when they'll start breeding. Right around 10 years is the, kind of their breeding lifespan if, if everything goes right. Let's talk a little bit about where they where they are in their range. So Washington is in the the southern extent of its range, and they don't, it doesn't just stop in Washington, but it's primarily a northern boreal owl and uh, British Columbia all through Canada and into uh, the, the Yukon and Alaska. There's a lot of, a lot of owls, but uh, Washington and some other western states are, are in the southern extent of its range. The Okanagan Highlands area is thought to have the largest population in Washington. You know, there, no one has ever really confirmed that, but a renowned birder were to want to go find a great gray, they would come here, okay, and they would come right here to the highlands. So um, we live in a really, really special place. They're local resident year-round here in the highlands, which is pretty special. So they, they, they don't migrate like the, the snowy owls do, they, snowies go from the, the tundra clear down into, um, into the states. Great grays will stay fairly local. They might change eleva elevationally a little bit, but for the most part, they're, they're a year-round resident. They're primarily breeding in the highlands um, that, that I could find, and then um, we, we do have some other occurrences over in the Loomis area south towards Conconelli in, in that, that fourth uh, in, that, in those forests, and then also in, in the Blue Mountains. And a, a lot of research has been done in the, the northeastern Oregon area, and that's where most of the research uh, comes from. Strix species. So my wife says, what is a Strix? Did you spell something wrong here? And typically I would have spelled something wrong, but um, she's a fourth grade teacher, and she was proofreading this for me the other night, and she says, honey, come here. I think you've spelled something wrong. And so I said, no, Strix is the genus, and they're generally docile. So um, one thing I, I ask folks if they come up and say, oh, I saw a great growl, they say, well, did it fly off? And if they say yes, okay, I'm kind of on the fence, and so I start asking more questions. But if they say no, it just stood there, and I walked right up to it, and I kind of had a picnic lunch underneath it and took 50 pictures, and then I got bored and walked off. And I said, well, you probably saw a great growl if, if they described everything else. Others that have seen them have probably recognized that same trait as well. They're very, very docile, and you can walk right up to them with relative ease if you're, you're cognizant of just being nice and quiet and, and respecting their, their distance. Now, they, they will fly depending on time of year, but a lot of times you can walk right up to them. I was out in the field with a, another biologist, and we were doing some stream stuff, and Great Corral flies across the road and lands in a tree, and I stopped and this biologist had never seen one before, and I said, well, just go out and take a picture. And he looked at me like, well, it'll fly off. I said, no, no, it won't. Just go up, walk up, and take a picture. <laughs> you know, it, there are certain traits about certain species, and, and if you, you know them, you can get really close. And anyways, he got out of the vehicle and walked literally right underneath the tree and took a picture. So my, my point of that is if you do see one and you've got a camera or you just want to get a mental picture clo close up, is just take your time, walk up, and they're generally fairly docile. 
So just some quick facts of the great gray. The tallest forest owl with the largest wingspan. They're roughly about six feet when they spread wing to wing. The ranger district, we we just got a new ranger, and uh, he went out with with me the other day. And (laughs) interesting story that we go out around the corner up by Crawfish Lake, and here this giant owl takes off flying through this meadow, and the first thing he says is, holy crap, that's a big owl. And uh, I, I basically said the same thing. And, and, you know, as soon as I saw it, I knew what it was. So it was pretty special for us to see it together. Um, it, was, it was his first. But again, the first thing that comes to mind when you see one, if you've never seen one before, is that's a big owl. And, and a lot of people think, well, they're, they're not as big as the great horned owl, right? Because it's the great horned owl. But frankly, they're, they're about a quarter size bigger than, than the great horned. One of the most important things with all species is reproduction, right? And nest biology um, starts that off. Around the highlands, now this varies uh, on geographics, but around highlands, early March is when courtship begins. The male will come and find a female, and, and they'll, they'll usually pair bond for quite some time. And one thing I've really noticed in, in my findings is snow depth in the spring really influences the, the, the timing of the nest. So if we have a really late snowpack, nest production may be a little less and be longer. It'll be longer for them to hatch, longer for them to fledge. And one of the reasons that that's the case is they're a ground hunter, right? So if there's a, a snowpack that lingers, that's going to obstruct their availability of abundant food for chicks. So it would behoove them to wait a little longer in the season once that snow melts. So then everything's visible and not under three feet of snow. Males do uh, a really good job of bringing food to help conserve the, the energy of the females during that courtship. So he'll go off and hunt. If she's got a nest around, she'll stay fairly localized towards where that nest is. And he'll do a really good job of going out searching bringing food back for that female. And then once they, they choose a nest, a female will lay one, up to one, one to five eggs. In the highlands, my experience is one to three, and most often it's one. And I think a lot of that has to do with prey availability and just overall conditions. You know, that makes sense because if you've got a, a lot of food, you're going to have a lot of young. And the, the studies in Oregon showed that where prey abundance really influenced chick um, numbers. And in the highlands, you know, w- again, one to three is what I've seen. The best is three uh, out of one nest, but typically I'm, I'm in that one to, to two range. And then for whatever reason, the, the, the eggs are susceptible to, to failure and about 20% fail. And that can be anything from predation to just a, a young female, just not uh, knowing exactly how to, to incubate eggs. Incubation lasts about a month, 30 to, to 36 days. That's what the book says, but right around a month is what I go by. So you figure if they are laying eggs about the, the 1st of April, okay, they, they've court shipped in, in March, they're laying eggs around the 1st of April, then they'll incubate about 30 days and then the, the young will stay in the nest about 30 days. That gives me about a June, June 1 timeline when chicks should be ready to come out of the nest. So once the, young's, uh, once the owlets or young hatch, they'll, they'll stay in the nest for about 30 days and are 100% fed by the, the male and female. And the male, he is a, an avid hunter. He's out hunting for the little ground mice and, and voles and stuff like that. And a lot of what they'll bring back to the nest are pieces of shrews and, and the voles. And that's because the, the chicks are, are way too young to swallow them whole. But the female, it'll sit there and brood the, the young for, again, right out a month while the, the male, he's out uh, really hunting hard. And around the 1st of June is when the owlets leave. I was grabbing some stuff out of my rig today and I looked at my notebook and the one nest I had this year that, that had one one chick in it, it fledged the 16th of June. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why is that? So I, I kept looking back and I try to keep logs of, of snow depth and stuff. And we just, we had a little linger 
in this certain area of snow. So I, I'm thinking maybe that's why it was. So once the owlets leave the nest, the female is fierce in protecting the, the owlets. One reason is because the owlets, once they try to fly out, they just drop to the ground and they're really susceptible to any ground predators, coyotes, house cats, dogs, you name it, they're susceptible. And in the literature, the the females have been noted to attack joggers and hikers and stuff like that within about that first week. So being really, you know, really aggressive to anybody and anything coming around, around the chicks. The males will continue to feed up to three months, the young, once they fledge. And the female, usually right around a month period, she'll leave and venture off within about a half mile and just kind of do her thing, regain her energy, is why I think they leave and leave the care and the feeding primarily up to the male. So, so what the owlet's doing now is calling... Of course, what the owlet's saying now is, that's all you got? That was about June 10th, and again, this, this little guy, he didn't fledge until about the third or fourth week of June, so fairly late. Again, they have the traits of the adults right away, the, the bright yellow eyes, relatively smaller facial discs, but yellow beak, real downy feathers. We go from nesting biology to nesting habitat, and the nests are commonly found in mature conifer, conifer forests to no surprise adjacent to the, the open meadows, open wet and, and or dry meadows. And I think I just explained the Okanagan Highlands, right? That's why I think we have some of the best habitat in Washington is because conifer forests mature next to the, the meadows. They're generally in canopy cover 50% or more. There's a lot of shade over the top of it, a lot of shade over the top. And that does two things, it, you know, thermal regulation, but it also protection from avian predators. They, they get just harassed by birds and especially ravens and stuff like that. Leaning trees are very important. In every nest stand that I've went to, there's this component, and all the literature points to it. And the reason for that is, is when the owlets hit the ground, literally on the ground or a stump for the first one to three days, okay, and then they're great climbers. Their talons are amazing. The, the chicks, the owlets, they have just a smaller version of, of those talons. They could climb trees within a week. If there were no leaners, they would be on the ground level for over a week. But these leaner trees provide a ladder, per se, to get up to the next limb. And then from there, they'll stay for about a week at, at that level, and then they'll have enough strength to just climb vertically straight up. But these are really important to them, these leaner trees. If we do specific thinning for great grays in certain stands, I'll actually go through and tell the, the crew to not cut the tree flat down on the ground horizontal, but to hang them up and try to provide some of that leaning habitat for the outlets because that, that's a really critical point for nesting habitat. One of the most important things that uh, great grays need are dead tree component. It's a twofold thing, and it provides nests, and it also provides prey habitat. There's two types of nests. There's stick nests, and then there's the platform nest. They're a platform nester, and even stick nests, again, uh, just like a platter or a platform, they, they need that platform some larger trees as they break off they provide that platform as well we'll talk a little bit about that too this is a really important fact um, and, and kind of a unique fact about great grays is they're a secondary nester what's a secondary nester mean is they don't build their nest they will literally not even take a stick and fluff up the pillow per se they they rely completely on what is there in nature or what one of their forest uh, raptor uh, abandons the, the year before. So they really need help from either Mother Nature providing a platform or from abandoned stick nests. Overall, in general, I would say we're, we're fairly deficit on platform nests. And one of the reasons is because a lot of these big old trees aren't on the landscape anymore. They've either fallen over or they just haven't been able to grow big enough they get harvested or 
cut for somebody's wood pile or, or something like that. What was done in the past is let's make some nests similar to a bluebird nest box, but hey, let's make a, a platform nest for gray corrals. But what this does is it provides a, a nest for the great grays. They don't have to build anything at all. It's just a kind of a V-shaped platform with the flat bottom and bolted uh, screwed or bolted to a tree. We don't do a lot of monitoring of these, but they're scattered around our forest. And when we get out to, when, when I get out to certain areas, I'll go check and, and see if anything's uh, living in them. One up by the Highland Snow Park was successful, had two or three chicks, I believe, fledge out of it the, the one year. And of course, uh, it got fairly popular on the, the blogs and I think it got loved to death, but um, this might be a fun project for you and the grandkids or you and the kids or whatever to put on your property if you live in some habitat that you might think is great gray owl habitat. And you would want to be roughly, you know, 50 feet in the air, so you're going to have to figure out how to get all the way up there. Other owls that would use this sort of platform are great horned owls. And then also uh, ravens and, and crows and stuff. So a lot of raptors will use these. One of the landowners, uh, I know him really well, he says, hey, Matt, I've got some great grays in my house. And bing, the light goes off. It's March. And I said, keep me updated in a month. So he comes back and says, hey, Matt, the great grays are still there. And now it's May. And I'm getting really excited because I know that they're starting to really hone in. And I said, well, go out and find the nest for me. Lo and behold, a pure uh, mistletoe clump just happened to be r what they wanted. And everybody's seen a mistletoe clump before. They, they grow perfect flat tops a lot of times. And if you ever see one, just take a look up because you might see this guy poking up. This is my mistletoe kick. Dwarf mistletoe it stops the, the, the really good growth of trees so they, they hardly ever get very big. And they infest the, the other younger trees, and the younger trees just kind of do nothing. And mistletoe is good for the forest if it's in moderation. But just like any disease, if it's left to, to take off rampant, you would get this really unhealthy forest. So a good combination of disease and healthy trees is, is what we want. So if you're on your property or out in the forest and you want to, you know, see some evidence uh, you you know you see that there might be a tree you think there might be a, a nest under just take a look at your feet and look around for owl pellets i think everybody's probably dissected a pellet in some, their science classes so you know a little gray regurgitated uh, pellet with bones in it um, or you might find some whitewash which is uh, looks like you know seagull poop or something like that underneath the tree for the largest forest owl with the largest wingspan they go after some really tiny pieces of food in the form of small, small prey. A great horned owl, they'll take your cat, right? The great gray owl, they go after some of the smallest forest prey uh, out there. So again, that's kind of a unique thing. You would think the, the largest owl out uh, in the forest would go after the, some big stuff, right? It's not, it's not the case with the great grays. They, they really key in on those little, little species like mice and stuff like that. And, and we'll get into that later. But for such a large owl, they, they go after really, really small prey. They are a, a perch hunter, so they'll go and they'll find a perch, and they'll sit on a branch uh, about as big as your pinky for uh, a long time. They'll sit there in the, in the same spot and just watch the ground because they can hear the rodents on the ground, and, is, and then they'll just pounce right on them. Okay, let's go right into foraging habitat. The foraging habitat is in moist and or dry, deep soil. I underline the, the deep soils because it's really important. That's why the highlands is so productive. And you ask, well, why does deep soil matter? If we had rock here, we wouldn't have the pocket gophers, the shrews, the voles, the, those little creatures that, that like that deep, moist soil and or, or dry soil. So, um, you know, that's really important. And that's what I think the, the highlands provides for these guys. Relatively open understory timber stands is also where they'll hunt. If a, tr a nest tree is, is too far from a meadow opening, they'll, they'll try to find something similar close. With, you know, open meadows, dark overstory timber, riparian zones, timber openings, where you have more canopy cover and just more cover in general. 
next to these open meadows. Even ag fields are really good for them too. Okay, let's talk about the prey. I've kind of touched a little bit about it, but their number one prey that they, at least the literature has been talking about, is a pocket gopher. And probably everybody hates the pocket gopher, right? If you've got a yard and you see the little trails, that's the culprit. But if you've got great gray great gray owls around, keep these guys around because they they love pocket gophers. Over 60% in the, the study down in Oregon, they preyed on pocket gophers. So again, pocket gophers aren't very big, but they're abundant. And generally, where do you see them? You see them in the, the openings, the roadbeds, meadows. Once that snow leaves, you see those little trails. They go all over. And if you've got a nice yard, you might curse them out. But the great gray, they love them. The, the other one is the redback vole. And boy, they're not very big. They're just a little vole. And this is a really common one for around here. Other prey species of this size, shrews. Uh, there's other species of voles too. So any little uh, mouse, you know, field mice, anything like that, if you've got populations of those and you live close to the habitat I just described, then you, you probably have a good chance you'll have great grays around the place. Some alter alternative prey that, that they've been known to eat based on pellet collection and dissection, of course, we've got the red squirrel. Red squirrels are abundant everywhere, but I, they're, they're alternate prey. They're not their primary prey. But if you live in an area where there's maybe more red squirrels than, than some other um, critters, then, then they're going to go after the, the red squirrel. And then here's the northern flying squirrel. The, these guys are also known to be in their, in their diet. But they're, again, they're, they're a larger species. This is the, the size of, of species, um, the, the barred owl and then the, the great horned owl. Some of their, the closer forest owls would, would prey on. Competitors. Uh, most everybody's familiar with the great horned owl, most common owl that everybody tells me about. And again, you know, right away I say, you know, did it have horns? Well, yeah, but not very big. So the, they want to keep shrinking the horns down to say they saw a great gray owl. But frankly, if they've got horns, more than likely around here, it's a it's a great horned. Could be a, another owl, like a long-eared owl or, or something like that. But um, for the most part, this is what we have. Someone came up early and asked me about some owls that they they have a lot of activity in January and right away that's the the great horned owl they're the earliest um, owl nester around here so if you've got owl nesting activity early uh, January February that's the great horned owl so the barred owl he's not well liked by a lot of folks including the the folks that are fond of the spotted owls over on the coast this is a cousin this is also a strict species note the barred chested the the spotted owl he would have bars going uh, horizontal whereas the barred are vertical but just the contrast of the other two owls that i just talked about yellow beak but those eyes those aren't pretty like i wouldn't want to do a presentation about barred owls because they don't look pretty right <laughs> so I, you know i always ask i always ask questions about the eye they said what do the eyes look like do they look like devil eyes and uh you know just black holes that, you know, that's a barred owl. And both are competitors to to the great gray. The great gray, even though he's the largest, got the biggest wingspan forest owl out there, these two will outcompete generally for habitat. And I've got a lot of habitat that I, I know of on, on national forest ground here on the Tanaska district that um, I have barred owls in. That would be great habitat for great grays. But for now, they're taking the, the little niche. Another thing, if you know you live in owl country, pay attention to time of year you hear them, time of year you see them, and then what it sounds like. The most common one is uh, "Who cooks for you?" If if it sounds like "Who cooks for you," it's the the barred owl. Just listen to that um, hoot, and it'll tell you right away what it is. This podcast is produced by Okanagan Highlands Alliance. OHA is located in Tanaskit. 
a town in the heart of the Okanagan Valley of North Central Washington. We are inspired by the beauty and diversity of the landscape that surrounds us, from the aspen and conifer forests, to the highland lakes, to the tumbling creeks that descend, to the wide, glacier-carved Okanagan River Valley. We engage in environmental advocacy, habitat restoration, and educational activities in our efforts to protect local ecosystems for future generations. To learn more about OHA or to become a member, please visit our website, okanaganhighlands.org. Thanks to Matt Marsh of the U.S. Forest Service for providing the presentation. Sound effects by zapsplat.com. Theme music written and performed by Tyler Graves and Andy Kingham.